Today, we're talking about chord inversions and Roman numeral analysis from a classical standpoint, specifically the basics in relation to triads, dominant seventh, and diminished seventh chords. That way, if you see the notation in my ear training videos or you're doing some music theory, you'll understand what these numbers mean. I made these lecture notes and worksheets available as a PDF to download for free or pay what you can if you're a student. If you're a teacher using it for your studio or classroom, there's a small suggested donation so I can keep making these resources and videos. First half has the notes and second half has exercises and answers. If you would like to support this channel, I have two albums currently available to buy or stream. There are also PDFs in my shop, including this music theory zine I made with shorthand notes, which has its own full walkthrough video. Page 3 is conveniently about the chords we're discussing today. Links and timestamps are in the description. First, a little review. What are chords? A chord is the name given to multiple notes sounded simultaneously. A lot of textbooks say three or more notes, but there is a term for two notes, which is a dyad, it's just less commonly used. Three notes is a triad. Building a triad is pretty simple. We start with a snowman. Pick a starting note, which becomes your root, and build up in thirds, which gives you notes on a line, 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 or space, space, space. Then, depending on the quality of the chord, you alter the notes above the root with accidentals. We want to keep the relationship of thirds, so we alter with accidentals rather than changing the note name. For example, a C minor triad is C, E flat, G, and not C, D sharp, G. Even though, visually, the distance is the same, the note names C to E is a third, but C to D is a second, and we need stacked thirds. Out of these triads, the smallest is diminished with stacked minor thirds, minor is minor third and major third, major is major third and minor third, and augmented is stacked major thirds. Another way to see this is building by third and fifth from the root. For a diminished triad, this means a minor third and diminished fifth. Minor is minor third and perfect fifth. Major is major third and perfect fifth. And augmented is major third and augmented fifth. In music theory, the letter names matter and context matters. Even though these two chords sound the same, and I'm playing the exact same keys on the piano, the way you notate the chord is different depending on the key and context. For ear training, you could simply say this is a major triad. For theory though, it could be F sharp major or G flat major. So far we've seen chords arranged within a narrow range, usually no more than an octave, meaning that they are in close position, sometimes also written as closed position. More than an octave between top and bottom notes means that the chord is in open position. In a scale, each note has a label called a scale degree to show the position of a note in relation to the tonic. The first and main note of the scale is the tonic or scale degree 1. And here is a C major scale with 1 through 7. The tiny hat on top to imply a scale degree, and you might see 8 or 1 for the upper octave as well. Little hat is called a carrot. I'm approaching this from a classical background, so we use Roman numerals to show chords built on these scale degrees. As for the note names, tonic is the first note, the second note is supertonic, third is mediant, fourth is subdominant, fifth is dominant, sixth is submediant, seventh is subtonic, or if it is specifically a half step or semitone below the tonic, it is the leading note or leading tone. One thing to note is that the subdominant note, which is the fourth note, is called subdominant because it is a fifth below the tonic, whereas dominant is a fifth above the tonic. This works the same with mediant being the third above and submediant being a third below the tonic. This is why submediant is not the second note and has led to some confusion, so I'm mentioning it just in case. For C major, if we build triads on top of these scale degrees using only the notes available in the scale, this is what we get. And here are the ones for natural minor scale and harmonic minor scale. The case of the Roman numeral tells you what the quality of the chord is. Uppercase implies a major chord. Lowercase is a minor chord. Lowercase with a tiny degree sign is diminished. And uppercase with a tiny plus sign is augmented. All of these triads were labeled using functional chord symbols. Functional chord symbols are usually written below the staff and will also indicate the inversion of the chord. You may have seen something like this called figured bass. 
This notation has numerals and symbols written above, below, or next to a bass note. As someone who plays a keyboard instrument capable of playing chords, I would realize the bass, meaning I would play the bass and add notes on top, which can be improvised or determined beforehand, and all of this is guided by what's written with these symbols. This notation was very common in the Baroque era, roughly 1600 to 1750, where you'd have the melody or solo parts being accompanied by the basso continuo, which would provide the harmonic structure and play the bass line and chord progression. This is a whole topic by itself, so we're going to go back to talking about chords. Starting with triads and inversions. Let's take this one chord, which is in root position. For root position, this is our original snowman for a C major triad. We build a regular triad stacked in thirds of C, E, G. The C is the root of the chord, which is the bottom note in this case, and this is the note the chord is built on. E would be the third, which is the middle, and G would be the fifth, which is on top. Think of it as counting from one through five. The root is normally how we name the specific chord. So C major, C minor, C diminished, etc. And typically build it by stacking thirds as we've already seen. There are of course exceptions and alterations, but we're sticking with the basic triad for today. If we move the bottom C to the top, which makes E the new bottom note, we have first inversion. The root of the chord is still C but the base of the chord, which is the lowest note, is now E, so we would call this a first inversion C major triad. If we take this E and move it on top, which makes G the bottom note, we now have second inversion. If we take the G and put it on top, we're back to root position. This means that the triads have a root position, first inversion, and second inversion. Now let's take these numbers in relation to triads. The order of saying these symbols out loud is the Roman numeral first, and then top to bottom for the other numbers. Here we have 1, 1, 6, and 1, 6, 4. However, these are actually short forms. The fully written out version would be 5, 3, 6, 3, and 6, 4. These numbers refer to the interval or distance from the bass note written. All we have to do is take your bass note, so C, and count up 3, which is E, C, counting up 5, is G. Next we have E as the base, we count up 3 from E is G, and 6 from E is C. Last one, the base is G, we count up 4 is C, and up 6 from G is E. Seem familiar? All we're doing here is writing out the inversions that you've probably already played before, but using different notation. If you already have the letter names of a chord and want to determine what it is called, Restack it in thirds to figure out the root of the chord and then determine the quality of the chord. For example, this is E A C, which is not stacked in thirds. So A and C are already stacked, so I bring E on top, which makes this an A minor triad. If we're still in C major, we know that A is the sixth note of the C major scale, which makes this a 6 6 4 chord which is written in lowercase since it's a minor triad. If we were in the key of A minor instead, this would be a 1-6-4 chord. Now here's what can be confusing and very related to the ear training videos that you may have watched. The lowest note played from the chord determines what inversion you are in. So if the lowest note here is C, we are in root position. Lowest note is E, we are in first inversion. Lowest note as G, we are in second inversion. Commonly, in harmony class, you'll deal with chorales which need four voices, S-A-T-B, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. There is also keyboard style with three voices in the treble and one in the bass. A triad only has three voices, which means that generally one note needs to be doubled for it to be four voices. Sometimes you'll see a doubling of a note or even a note omitted and another one tripled for a seventh chord. There are rules and guidelines involved for proper voice leading and resolving chords. So as you're advancing in your studies when you're looking at more exercises, just know that this is common practice and is deemed acceptable and or preferable depending on the context of the chords. If I ignore the left hand and look at just the right hand, it's in first inversion. It's three notes we saw before with E on the bottom, so it's first inversion. However, we just learned that the lowest note played from the chord, the full stack, determines what inversion you are in. So I have to look at the left hand, and the lowest note here is C which means that this is actually in root position. Does the order of the notes on top of the bass note matter? No, 
As long as the notes of that chord are present, it can be in any order on top of the bass note. That means that if we are using a C major chord, as long as C is the bottom note and all the notes on top are also C, E, G in whatever order, we are still in root position. The moment I change the lowest note, we now have a new inversion with E in the bass. Moving on to seventh chords. A seventh chord is a triad plus a note that forms an interval of a seventh above the root of the chord. Earlier we counted one to five, now we go up to seven. We can expand on the stack and each note we add will have that new name, so ninth, eleventh, thirteenth chords. However, with these bigger stacks, certain notes are commonly omitted when dealing with those SATB chorales. Okay, so how can we build a dominant seventh, or some books call it major minor seventh chord? If we know the key, first we have to find the fifth note of the scale because it's the dominant. For C major, this is G. Then we stack our thirds again, but we have a seventh, so one, three, five, seven means four different notes. The interval between are a major third, minor third, and minor third. If we're doing it as three, five, seven, we have a major third, perfect fifth, and minor seventh. Or a major triad with a minor seventh on the outside. We are in a major key, so no extra accidentals are needed, which means G, B, D, F is the dominant seventh of C major. In a minor key, we have to remember to raise the seventh scale degree. If we have C minor, there is a B flat in the key signature, which needs to be raised to B natural. Therefore, we have to raise it to B natural for the G7 chord. Remember that the seventh scale degree is not necessarily the same as the seventh of a chord. In C minor, B natural is the leading note or scale degree seven. In the five seven chord, B natural is the third of the chord, but the seventh of the chord is an F. Another approach for the dominant sevenths. If you are given D7 and asked to notate it, we can write D F A C and then alter the notes with accidentals to fit the intervals mentioned. D is the root, F would need to be sharp to become a major third, A is good, and C is good. So our answer is D, F sharp, A, C. It's important to remember it has to be stacked thirds because if we called the second note G flat, it's a completely different chord for theory purposes. Once again, if you're listening to the chord, it's the same, but how you analyze on paper would be different. One more way to figure out D7 is that you already know it's a dominant seventh. D is the fifth note of the G major scale, and G major has an F sharp. So if I stack in thirds and add the key signature, we have D, F sharp, A, C. There is a difference between asking for a C7 chord versus the dominant seventh of C major. A C7 chord is C, E, G, B flat. The dominant seventh of C major is G, B, D, F. This is often a trick question on exams due to the wording, so I'm mentioning it just in case. All right, on to these numbers. The abbreviated form is what you'll commonly see. 5-7, five, 5-6-5, five, 5-4-3, five, five, and 5-4-2. The long form is 5-7-5-3, 5-6-5-3, 5-6-4-3, and 5-6-4-2. This works the exact same way as triads, but we have an additional note. First one, G to B, G to D, G to F. Next is first inversion, B to D, B to F, B to G. Second inversion, D to F, D to G, D to B. And last, F to G, F to B, and F to D. For seventh chords, we have root position, first inversion, second inversion, and third inversion. We'll continue with the abbreviations for the examples because that's likely what you'll see. As for diminished seventh chords, we'll look specifically at leading note diminished sevenths for today. First, we find the leading note. Some people count up to seven, but I find it easier to just go a semitone below the tonic. Then we stack minor thirds. For C minor, a semitone below is B natural. And we have to write the natural since it's B flat in the key signature. Then, D, F, A flat. It's normal to see a mix of flats and sharps. We have to remember that notes have to be a snowman stacked and then altered. For the other interval relationships, it's a minor third, diminished fifth, and diminished seventh. Or diminished triad with a diminished seventh on the outside. 
The same numbers apply here for inversions as with dominant sevenths. The difference for the notation underneath is seven diminished seven. When we have all stacked minor thirds, this is a fully diminished seventh, which is a degree symbol. If you see a tiny slash through the degree symbol, this means it's a half diminished seventh. This means instead of all stacked minor thirds, the top is a major third or diminished triad with a minor seventh on the outside. Okay, let's round out this lesson with some exercises. Once again, I made these questions available as a PDF that you can download if you want to follow along. Please pause the video for each question to complete it. Answers will be shown on screen after each exercise. If you would like some extra guidance, there is a separate video where I complete these exercises in live time and talk through the answers to show my process. Link is in the description. Thanks for watching and happy music making.